You know, I want to ask this question. What kind of mindset do you have? Do you find yourselves always reacting to, to some setback, challenge, or, or problem? And they could be of all sorts. Uh, do, you, do you react with a, you know, deluge of well-worn, familiar, you know, negative, self-deprecating epithets? Do you play a negative soundtrack in your head, you know, one more time, and you, you trot it out, and you say, oh, you know, I'm ugly, I'm fat, nobody likes me, I don't even like myself. I can't face this. I will never overcome this problem. I will never be able to do it. I'll never feel better. I will never be strong enough. I will never be smart enough. I will never be good enough. I will never be anything but a failure. I will never be able to correct my mistakes. I, my efforts don't make a difference. My, my efforts are, are inadequate. Uh, why bother trying? Everything always fails. I am too broken, and what's the point? Well, have you ever played any of that soundtrack before in your head? I, I know I have, you know, it's, I, I think if, if you're in this, you know, as we would say here, in the flesh, if you're in this world, in this part of this world, you probably have prayed, the, you know, played that, you know, more than once in your life, and then things have come up. You know, friends, you know, when we were baptized, we did not all, all of a sudden become perfect and holy is God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ are. Yeah, he said we are to be perfect as he is perfect. I, you know, that's really the New King James language. We are to be wholehearted. We are to be fully dedicated. We are to be fully engaged. But, you know, this is where we are. When we became Christ, who redeemed us with his own blood, he paid the, the penalty for our sins. We have a future. We have a hope. And in the course of this, you know, but, you know, we, 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 this should be something that is with us, that guards us, that is, you know, it's like as the Apostle Paul would say, a helmet of salvation that we put on because we did become Christ and we are his. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. But the fact that we are Christ doesn't mean that we've stopped becoming, you know, we stopped being human in the meantime. We are human. We are dust. But we need to look at something more than this. In Colossians in chapter 1 and verse 9, I'm going to cite this in the New Living Translation. Apostle Paul put it this way. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. See, Paul knew of them. He hadn't seen them at this point in time. There are a variety of commentators that speculate he was in prison at this point in time. And he had heard about the, the Colossian brethren, former pagans, people who had worshipped all the pagan, whatever, and they'd grown up in a completely pagan society. But they had turned to Christ when they heard the gospel. And Paul continues on here in Colossians 1 and verse 9. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. And they would need it. What kind of society were they living in? That Greco-Roman society that worshipped, you know, the pagan gods of Mount Olympus that, you know, that did all the things and had the attitudes that they did. I mean, everything would have been natural. They could, they would have played to themselves the scripts and society, uh, that their society had taught them and that they'd been raised with. But that wasn't a Christian, you know, of thoughts in mind. You know, and they would have had to all the time deal with all sorts of, you know, the negative mindsets, negative attitudes, perceptions. So he said, you know, we ask God. Paul was, was writing them, to give you uh, the complete knowledge of his will and then to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. 
All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. See, it is a process. We are growing to know God better and better, to be able to reflect His image, to be perfect as He is perfect, perfect to be holy as He is holy. It is a process we grow in. There are a lot of people who forget this and don't understand this, this, that it is this process we're growing in. Verse 11, we also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. Paul knew the Colossians were going to need endurance and patience in living in the society they were living in and having to work with themselves and what they thought because, you know, it, it's not like flipping a switch on a light. You know, last night we had uh, somebody down the road had knocked over a power, uh, power pole and all the lights were out. We had no electricity for a few hours, you know, from this standpoint. And you could, you know, flicking a light switch does nothing until the juice is on. And when the juice is on, you can flick a light switch on you know, from this standpoint, but we don't change our lives quite that simply. Our future is changed. We, you know, when we, when we repent and we uh, accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and as a propitiation for our sins, we are on a new path, but that doesn't immediately change everything that has gone into making us. So we pray, verse 11, that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so that you will have all the endurance and patience you need. Need to be overcomers, to overcome the society, to overcome yourselves. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father that he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people. So you're no longer a stranger from the covenants of God and the promises God has made. You, you know, that Paul this is, was making this point to them. To the, you know, these were people who, you know, they had grown up all their lives as being part of a Gentile pagan society. In many ways, much like our society right now, where people grow up all sorts of things and the attitudes towards, you know, sex and all the sanctity of life issues that they have. We, they, don't, they don't know any better than this. So he said that, and he reminded them that they belong to God's people who live in the light, in the light that Christ gives us, the light that he leads us through his power, through his wisdom, through his understanding. He, that in fact, that, that we have this hope, that we live in the light, he goes on here, we have a hope. This is a hope of salvation, for he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sin. This is our hope of, of salvation that Paul talks about very clearly, having put on the helmet of salvation in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. This, he talks about this. We're always giving thanks because we have this share of an inheritance that belongs to God's people. And we have, will live in the light. And we'll live in the light he is because he's transferred us into the kingdom of, a, of God, the kingdom of his dear son, because he purchased our freedom and he forgave us our sins. So we can be loose from that. We can be loose from all that negativity and the mindset and, and all the crappy recording that we have, have you know, carried around with us maybe from the time we were young children because of everything people said around us. Nasty, ignorant people. Or people who didn't know any better. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll start here at verse 14, about, you know, a little bit in in this verse, not at the very beginning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Anyways, since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. 
He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. See, Christ is alive, and he was raised for you, and he was raised for me. He is there. He is with us. And again, we have put on that helmet of salvation because we have, you know, this, this hope of a future, of living with him in his kingdom forever and ever. And when we fall into a negative, self-deprecating mindset, you know, we play those ugly tapes about ourselves, the discouraging things that we can say to ourselves. We fall into what, what the Apostle Paul would call, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, he would call one of Satan's devices, or in some of the modern translations put it, one of Satan's schemes. Because if he can have us thinking on a negative track all the time, oh, I'm too fat, I'm too ugly, I'm too dumb, I'm too this, I'm too that, I'm too whatever it is, I'm too sick, I'm too weak, whatever it might be, he puts us into this negative of aspect of mindset. It's one of his devices, devices so he can discourage us so that we would fall away and just stop doing because we say there's no hope for us when there's all the hope in the world. We need to remember that we are now part of God's family as his children. He calls us his children. This, the Apostle John talks about this. This is remarkable. He calls us his children, and so we are. And, you know, and as his children, what does that mean? Well, we're part of the family of God. And the family of God can never and will never and is never in harmony with the devil and his demons. And as consequently, because of that, they're always going to be sitting there trying to trip us up and spiritually destroy us if they can. I mean, that's just, you know, the facts of life. You know, one of the immutable facts of this universe. If you are Christ, you, you know, you are Abraham's seeds and heirs according to all these wonderful promises gave, but from the beginning, Satan has been always there to foul up to whatever degree he can, you know, God's plan for humanity, for his children. We, you know, will never be in harmony with Satan, so he's always going to be out there. He's looking for a way. He's got his devices. See what, you know, it's, as Paul himself said in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 6 and verse 15. Come with, you know, go with me here to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15. I'm going to read this one, the Amplified Bible version. 2 Corinthians 6.15. Paul said, what harmony can there be between Christ and Belial, that is, Satan? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. We, right now, as Christians, flesh and blood Christians, we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell among them and walk among them. And he's doing this by his Holy Spirit. Now, we're coming up to Pentecost in a couple of weeks, and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. See, I will dwell among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So... Come out from among unbelievers and be separate and do not touch what is unclean. The whole idea of unclean is, a, is, pretty, is pretty strange in our society in some ways. You know, here with the pandemic going on, we, we have this, you know, hand washing ritual we're supposed to do while we count to 20 or whatever it might be and supposed to rub down this and rub down that and all these things that people do right now, okay? So we can flatten the curve. 
never mind the fact that the curve is still the curve and there's as much distribution and as many people, whatever. It's just that we're trying to spread it out over time. Hey, that's great. Let's spread it out instead of getting all over at once. Well, whatever. Anyways, do not touch what is unclean and I will graciously receive you and welcome you. So we're not to touch what is unclean. Here's the, here. and of course, Paul in writing this, in the ancient world, they had a little bit better idea of what he was talking about. And I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Yes, the Lord Almighty has sons and daughters. I'm, I'm sorry, well, how many you got it wrong? <laughs> Well, how many you got it wrong? Anyways, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. You will be my family, my children. So what does he mean? Let's go further here. Because, you see, you know, do not touch what is unclean. Let's go to Mark chapter 7 in the Gospels. Let's see one of the interesting teachings here of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah our Christ, our high priest, our elder brother. Mark chapter 7 and verse 1. Then the Pharisees, you know, religious leaders, mainline Protestants of the day, if you would, <laughs> and some of the scribes from Jerusalem came together to him. And when they saw some of the disciples eating with defiled hands, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. Oh, you, you haven't washed your hands. You've come from the market and you haven't, wa you haven't done your 20 seconds of whatever and, and gotten everything and, and done all this and, you know, all these things. And, you know, you, you haven't washed your hands. <laughs> and they found fault. Just like we have all sorts of people will find fault these days too for something. Anyways, for the Pharisees and all the Jews hold fast to the tradition of the elders and do not eat unless they wash their hands thoroughly. I'm not saying, well, you know, you're not supposed to wash your hands when you come away from doing that. That's not my point, okay? That wasn't Jesus' point too, but they, they were focusing on uh, the, the twigs instead of the branches here from a spiritual lesson that Jesus is giving. Let's go on. Verse 4. Even when coming from the market, they do not eat unless they first wash themselves. And there are many other things that they have received and observed, such as washing of cups and pots and brass utensils and tables. Now, you know, staying clean, is, there's nothing wrong with that, cleaning the dishes. <laughs> I hope you do clean the dishes, you know. You'll stay healthier. You know, you follow a lot of the specific things dealing with physical things, you know, what you do with sewage and all this. The Bible has all sorts of, you know, rules and, and, and laws and, and traditions on this, which were good to keep people healthy. However, that is not, you know, and Jesus said, there's something here more that you should, should see and what he's pointing out to them. For this reason, anyways, the Pharisees and the scribes questioned him, saying, Why don't your disciples walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Here's a tradition, and they were finding a great deal of fault with the fact that some of Jesus' disciples weren't following, you know, some of the customs of their day. It's just like if you were not listening to the uh, chief health officer, you know, from this standpoint, is that going to, should you be thrown in prison or condemned because of... Anyways, verse 6. And he answered and said to them, Well did the Isaiah prophesy concerning you hypocrites, because they were making a big profession of faith, that they were the great big religious people, they were the good people, they were the righteous people, you should listen to us. As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, and their, and, but their hearts are far away from me. So they made a show out of being righteous. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Verse 7, but in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. This has always been a problem with a lot of organized Christian religion for a long, long, long time. If you really go into it and look at what they teach and the doctrines, how much of it is the traditions of men rather than the commandments of God. Okay, you think about that. Anyways, 
Verse 8, for leaving the commandment of God, you hold fast to the tradition of men, such as the washing of pots and cups. You practice many other things such as this. You, in other words, you're, you're majoring in the minors. Then he said to them, full well you do reject the commandment of God so that you may observe your tradition, which is what a lot of mainline religionists who say they're Christian do. They reject the commandment of God to follow traditions of men, purely and plainly. Okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm getting under the, under the skin of a few people from that standpoint, but that's the way it is. Anyways, that's what Jesus said. You, you know, this is what Jesus said. This is not Jeff Patton's uh, scripture here. Verse 10, For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and the one who speaks evil of father and mother, let him be put to death. Okay, referring back to the Torah, the commandments of God. Okay? But... You say, if a man shall say to his father and mother, whatever benefit you might receive from, from me is Corbin, and that is to set aside as a set aside as a gift of God, he is not obligated to help his parents. No, we don't have to do anything more for you, so we're, we're dumping you off. Okay, we're going to put you in a, a, a retirement home. Let's, you know, let the state take care of you instead. And you excuse him from doing anything for his father and mother, nullifying the authority of the word of God by your tradition, which you have passed down, and you practice many other traditions such as this. And after calling all the multitudes to him, he said to them, Hear me, all you, and understand. There is nothing that enters into a man from outside which is able to defile him. You know, it's going to make him unclean, just some material thing. He touches something in the marketplace and maybe it's got a little dirt on it or something like this. That doesn't defile him. He's speaking spiritually speaking. Nothing from outside which is able to defile him, but the things that come out from within him, those are the things which defile a man in God's sight. In their mind, what's coming out of the mind? What kind of negative mindset are they, gen are they generating these thoughts? Those are the things that defile a person, a human being. Then he said, verse 16, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So, you know, pay attention, Jesus was saying. Now, this is, he was saying this is in public, in the marketplace. Now, when he went into the house... This is this rental house that he had, I guess. I think, I think at this point in time is in Capernaum. When he went into a house, maybe it wasn't, away from the multitudes, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said to them, are you likewise without understanding? Don't you get it? <laughs> Don't you follow what I'm, what I'm saying here? Don't you perceive that anything that enters into a man from the outside is not able to defile him? It's not able to make him unclean. For it does not enter into his heart, but into his belly, and then it passes out into you know, his elimination system, the, the sewer. This is the way, the purging all food, you know. So, you know, whatever you eat, it goes through the bowels and the stomach and then comes out, you know, the other end. And he said, that which springs from within a man, that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart, you know, in other words, out of the, out of the, out of the thoughts of a person, go forth evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, guile, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all sorts of evil, negative thoughts of whatever might, you know, the being can be. Things that aren't praiseworthy and good in the sight of God. I mean, we are, you and I, we're created in the image and likeness of God. We praise God for what we have and for all the things he gives. The things, as he said, you know, all these evil negative mindsets and these negative thoughts that come from within us, these are what defile a human being. And we're, of course, to come out from those things. We're, we're not to, to, you know, and that's, we're not to touch the unclean. We are to change our thoughts in this. Let's go to Proverbs 13, 4. 
and I'm going to cite this from my own paraphrase. <laughs> you know, actually, I looked at a variety of translations, and I took a little, I said, oh, I like the way he put this and put that. But anyways, the soul of the person with a negative mindset craves much, yet gets little because that one's own personal defeatism overcomes positive ambition, but the soul of the diligent, the one who willingly and faithfully works on his own problems and challenges, will be richly and abundantly supplied with solutions from the Lord, of course, one way or the other. Then you have Proverbs 22, verse 13. The Lord preserves those with godly knowledge, but he frustrates false words, faithless words, negative words. The mentally sluggish person manufactures excuses and say, there's a lion out there standing in the way. If I go outside and get on with my life, I might be killed. Well, you know, Whatever our problems do, they stand in the way and, and, for, and keep us from doing what we need to do. You know, it's one of, see, this is one of the devices of Satan. We need to have on our head the fact that it's put on the, the helmet of salvation so that we know that because of Christ's sacrifice, his forgiveness of our sins, the fact that he is present, that we have a relationship with God the Father, that we pray and ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, this, we can change. The spirit that's within us is, is more powerful than the spirit which is in the world. Truly, each of us, you know, you know, it's, you know, we, we each have those things that, can, you know, sometimes can appear to us, especially when we get down on it, they seem to be intractable. You know, they dog us. But, you know, they don't have to, you know, get us to the point we, we can change, we can grow, we can overcome. We have been forgiven. We are being forgiven. We fall and we pick ourselves up. We need to re remember that, you know, whatever our problems are, you know, they're, they're not as great as the problems of our foes, <laughs> our spiritual foes. You know, we have to remember we do have a spiritual enemy because we are part of God's family. We are his part of the family of God. You know, there are those who are going to hate us just for that. And Satan is always there. And he's there to always, you know, foul us up. If he can get us on a negative bent, he'll try it. The Apostle Peter, you know, counseled the brethren. He said to us, Still as good now as it was when Peter said it almost 2,000 years ago. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, which means, you know, be mentally well balanced. Be self-disciplined with the kinds of stuff that we allow passing through our thoughts. Be sober. Be alert. And cautious at all times, which is a hard thing to do sometimes but we have to recognize you know the danger can be there anytime and the, you know because thoughts can appear at whatever point in time that enemy of yours the devil prowls around like a roaring lion and lions roar when they're fiercely hungry and the devil is always hungry to, you know to destroy any of god's children seeking someone to devour and then peter admonishes this, the church all of us, he says, but resist, him, but resist him, be firm in your faith, knowing in whom we have believed. The just will live by faith. You know, Jesus said, you know, we shouldn't be anxious about this or that. You know, sufficient to one day is, you know, the problems that we have. You know, don't go to bed with it. Don't go to bed when you're angry. You know, let it go. Put your faith in God. Know that, you know, tomorrow is a new day. But re resist him. Be firm in your faith against his attack. Be rooted, established, immovable, because you have that helmet of salvation. You have the faith that you know what God has planned for you ultimately. That whatever the problems and difficulties we have in this transitory existence that we currently enjoy, and that's all we 
know of existence at this point in time. We know we have something better that's, that's, that's out there in the future for us. Resist them. Be firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world and throughout history. There's nothing that has come upon you and me that others have not gone through. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. I'm going to read this one to Phillips. And in some ways, Phillips is more of a paraphrase, but... Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. Phillips puts it to the point, and this is very good. He said, Paul was saying to the Corinthians brethren, he said, the truth is that although, of course, we lead normal human lives, <laughs> normal for what it was back then at the time when they had temples to all the, you know, the idols of the Greeks and the Romans and all the weird things that they did at that, you know, that although we lead normal lives in the society we're living in, the battle we are fighting is on the spiritual level. Because you know, we live as Christians, we're living on, we have a different thing. We're seeing that which we should be looking forward and seeing that which cannot be so easily seen, but we perceive by faith, by the word of God. That although we lead normal human lives, the battle we are fighting is on the spiritual level. The very weapons we use are not those of human warfare. No, it's not going out and buying your AR-15 or whatever it might be and stocking up you know, your, your, your ammo supply, whatever it could be. No, that's not how we wage warfare. The weapons we use are not those of human warfare, but powerful in God's war warfare for the destruction of the enemy's strongholds of doubt, of negativity, of hate, of resentment discouragement, lack of faith. Our battle is to bring down every deceptive fantasy and every imposing defense that men erect against the true knowledge of God. Of course, you know, yeah, all those that say God doesn't exist, you know, we're evolution, you know, this incredible world we have is just by, you know, blind chance, you know, there's no you know, there's no intelligent design to any of this. There's no transcendent purpose, you know, all this sort of stuff. And then he goes on, Paul says, we even fight to capture every thought until it acknowledges the authority of Christ. So we, we need to put ourselves into perspective. We are just human beings. We are just flesh. But we, God is calling us his children. He calls that which is not yet really in existence, in existence. He sees us as uh, his children. He has made us such. We are God's children. Apostle John reaffirms that. And we, we are because of what he's done for us. And because of that, we have this future hope of salvation. We are, we are moved already into the kingdom of light. And when we die, we will be resurrected. We have this hope of salvation. We have put the helmet of salvation in our head, and we need to, you know, it, it to protect us in our spiritual battle with the devil. And every negative and hostile thought that would try to make us unclean. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11. Amplified Bible version. Paul says to Timothy, But as for you, O man of God, and I thought this was interesting because there's a note in the Amplified that, you know, that Paul, of course, Paul knew the scriptures back. He had been raised with them all the time in Hebrew, of course. <laughs> and this thing, O oh man of God, you know, it's, it's in, the, in the Old Covenant scriptures, it was a title that was used literally to refer to a man who officially spoke to God. O oh man of God, this is only the only place that you'll find it used in the New Covenant scriptures. But of course, the scriptures are written for us, O oh man of God. O woman of God, one who, you know, officially spoke 
speaks with God. And we do. We pray. <laughs> oh, man of God, you know, you, you prayer. is Our prayer of faith overcomes and accomplishes much. God hears us. But as for you, oh, man of God, flee from these things. You know, all the, the previous things that um, Paul was mentioning in his letter. Aim at and pursue righteousness. You know, folk on, focus on a positive mindset, not a negative mindset. Don't keep playing over and over in your head all those nasty things you can say about yourself, which may have been true in the past, but they're not anymore. Because you are changing your life. Your sins have been forgiven. You have that hope of salvation. That assurance, spiritual assurance. Flee from negativity, negative mindsets, negative thoughts. Aim at and pursue righteousness. You know, the true core, uh, the true goodness and conformity uh, of to God's character and His thoughts, being holy as He is holy, thinking as God would think, kindly, generously encouragingly towards yourself as well as others you know love your neighbor as yourself you must love yourself in the right and appropriate way because you are God's son or daughter and we love the children we love the brethren you you know love your neighbor as yourself it was very interesting from this it was a, a standard anyways Aim and pursue at righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Faith, you know, we are in a spiritual struggle with our adversaries, maybe even with ourselves. We fight the good fight of faith. You know, as the Amplified notes, you know, they say, you know, because we're in conflict with evil. Of course we are. We're part of the household of God. What do you think? You know, Satan's going to use all his devices to try to trip you and me up. He will. We can count on it. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. You know, that helmet of salvation. Eternal life. <laughs> to which you were called. And for which you made a good confession of faith in the presence of many witnesses, which we did when we were baptized. Verse 13, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and in the presence of Christ Jesus, who made a good confession in his testimony before Pontius Pilate. You know what he said, he knew he was going to get him nailed to a cross. You know, but he had vision. He was looking forward. You know, he was you know, he wasn't going to have a negative mindset. He was willing to do this because of the joy of knowing of what he would be able to bring many sons and daughters into the family of God, which was his purpose of coming to earth to begin with, who made a good confession before Pontius Pilate to keep all his precepts without stain or approach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ not to touch the unclean thing, which includes those thoughts which can come from within us, can defile us, which he will bring about in his own time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, God is going to send Jesus Christ in his good time when he wants it to happen. And we can rest assured, you know, like, uh, you know, we don't have that long to wait. We only have one human lifetime, our own, you know, whatever it means. We don't have to wait beyond that. Which you will bring about in his own time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign. Now, God is the only sovereign, the only absolute ruler. Um, Prime Minister of Canada, the President of the United States, uh, whoever it is, uh, or potentate of any other place, the dictator of China. Uh, you know, these are not really people who are sovereign. They're not sovereign in the universe. The king in whose reign, uh, of, who, of those who reign as kings and, and lord of those who rule as lords. Yes, there is a future. 
and all the scriptures and the prophecies and what Revelation say, is talking about when Christ comes again, as Lord of Lord and King of Kings will come to pass, and those who are His will be with Him at that point in time. So let's go to Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians, as we wrap this up here, getting close to the end, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1 in the Philips. Finally, brothers, do pray for us here. Pray that the Lord's message may go forward unhindered and may bring him glory. And I can say, yeah, we need your prayers. You know, these days, Google and the others, you know, they've, they've changed the algorithm so that, you know, our broadcast doesn't appear on the search engines of many as people. I mean, they're, the high-tech companies are doing a lot to suppress, <laughs> they, they, they are, the, the message of Christians in particular. May go forward and may bring him glory as it has done with you. Pray, too, that we may not be embroiled with bigoted and, wig and wicked men. For all men, alas, have not faith. Amen. Yet the Lord is utterly to be depended upon by all who have faith in him. And he will give you stability and protection against all that is evil. We do learn through the things and the trials and the struggles we face to depend on him completely. Because he's the one who will give us stability, at, you know, in our struggle. You know, so we can maintain our balance and protection against that which is evil. It is he who will make us feel confident. It is he who makes us feel confident about you. See, Paul was saying, you know, that it, very, very clearly that we can be confident of this. Knowing because I know whom I believe in, who has started this. I can have put my faith that... You're in good hands, in, in Jesus Christ's hands, God the Father's hands. As he who makes us feel confident about you, that you are acting and will act in accordance with our commands, and what the teachings that the apostle was giving. May he guide your hearts into ever deeper understanding of his love and the patient suffering of Christ. And we look at their example and think of their love and think of, of, of Jesus Christ and what he was willing to go through through you and me, for you and me. We can put these things into perspective. Philippians 4, verse 12, Apostle Paul in his ministry, he went through a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, he was a regular jailbird. <laughs> in and out of jail a number of times, beaten, you know, all the other things, shipwrecked, all the things. Paul says this in his letter to the Philippians, Philippians 4, verse 12, Amplified Bible Version. I know how to get along and how to live humbly in difficult times. And I also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing life, whether well-fed or going hungry, whether having an abundance or being in need. I can do all things he said, all things is, 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 is in scriptures note as he's called me to do. You know, Christ has things he asks us to do. I can do all things through him who strengthens and empowers me. See, as Christians, we depend upon Christ to do his will, his work through us. And we can do it because he will strengthen us and empower us. To fulfill his purpose. You know, Christ is our sufficiency. And we're equal and up to whatever task he's going to present and, and throw our way. We may, we, we may have to get sore. He has a word. We exercise spiritual muscles maybe we haven't used for a while. But we can overcome that and persevere if you were called to do this. Whatever he, you know, he, Jesus had to prepare himself to be crucified. He had to be, you know, he had to discipline himself in his mind. And he had to be ready to deal with these things. He, and whatever thoughts, negative thoughts he had when the devil would come and tempt him as he did when he was in the wilderness, just at the very beginning of his ministry, he was ready to stand firm and to, you know, self-discipline his thoughts. 
because of course he knew his father was going to infuse him with the with you know the strength and the spiritual peace that he needed in the face of his trial. Let's go to Ephesians chapter one and verse eleven. Back to Philip's here for a second. And here is a staggering thing, Philip's, for the way he puts it, that in all which will one day belong to him, we have been promised a share. See what all the things, all things are Christ. He is the one through things and for all things were for him. One day we will have a share. That is our hope of salvation that we put on our head as a helmet in the spiritual battle we face. We are promised a share. Since we were long ago destined for this by the one who achieves his purpose by his sovereign will, he will accomplish it. There's no one who can stand in his way. So that we... As the first to put our confidence in Christ, we are first fruits, and we're coming up to the, uh, the feast of the first fruits. You know, the birth of the church may bring praise to His glory. And you too trusted in Him when you heard the message of truth, and you did. That's why you're listening at this point. The gospel of your salvation. And after you gave your confidence to Him. You were, so to speak, stamped with the promised Holy Spirit as a guarantee of purchase. It is the proof of his purchase of us until the day when God completes the redemption of what he has paid for as his own. And that will again be to the praise of his glory. We have the hope of resurrection. He will redeem us. He will give us a spiritual body. You know, the day when we have some of the problems and the difficulties that we face now will be over. In the meantime, we have to have faith in him. Let's, let's close here with this verse in Philippians, which is always very encouraging. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. <laughs> Paul, writing to Philippians, said this. Delight yourself in God. Yes, find your joy in Him at all times. And that's sometimes, that's, you know, that's the only source we're going to find joy and comfort and peace. Maybe the conditions in this current life will not give you that at times. But yes, we can delight ourselves in God and find our joy in Him at all times because of the promises in the future that we are sure He will do. He will perform. Have <clears throat> then he Paul says to the brethren, he says, have a reputation for gentleness. You know, people know you're gentle, you're easygoing, you're kind, and never forget the nearness of your Lord. Which is easy to do. I mean, God is invisible. We don't see him. You know, he's not standing at our at our right hand. You know, from the stand. But he said, never forget. Paul said, never forget the nearness of your Lord. And God is near to you when you pray. He hears, which is an amazing thing to think about of all of all the people who pray to him. And don't worry over anything whatever. Tell God every detail of your needs in earnest and thankful prayer. And the peace of God which transcends human understanding. Maybe it doesn't make sense. But God, he said, the peace of God which transcends human understanding will keep a constant guard over your hearts and minds as they rest in Christ Jesus. Because we put on that helm of salvation, we have put our confidence in him, and we, are, we know he will deliver the goods at the end of it. He is there to be with us through what we face. So whatever sort of things you'd have and you're going through, don't play the old tape, you know, the negative mindset, of, you know, I'm too fat, I'm too ugly, I'm too weak, I'm too, you know, whatever it might be, I'm not sufficiently this or that. No, our sufficiency is in Christ and in God. I have the humility to walk with him as he leads us in, in, you know, in this course of life. And know and remember that we do have an enemy and do not be unaware of his device to set up negative thoughts in your mind. Guard your hearts and minds. Remember and focus on the salvation of what God has promised and walk in the way he would have you walk. Stay alert 
be self-disciplined and guard the doors of your mind because truly we have a great God who will help us in every means to succeed in our spiritual warfare. Till next time.